looked at it though is generally my take on it which I've tried to you know express in Architects of Control and other work and that is that look you can't continually be talking about tyrannies as if it is a gun to the head you know and we're being forced and coerced all the time sooner or later we're gonna have to re ask us a more deeper question what is it that the slave is doing to pro not only bring about his own enslavement but perhaps to even bring into being the enslavers because ultimately I believe that this master slave thing is a relationship it is in our relationships on the intimate domestic level and it is further up the fractal and as you know nine times out of ten in the so-called conspiracy or alternative movement that is not being dealt with there's a lot of finger pointing there's a lot of pointing out who the enemy is and that's very valid and important we need to do that but I approach a lot of this stuff from an occult tradition from a philosophical point of view never forgetting that there is a relationship here between the parasite and the host and to in a couple of lines just express what we were doing in Architects of Control for those who haven't seen it basically we're asking a question and that is is man accepting tyranny in all its forms both in intimate life and further up the fract are, are we accepting that because we would rather have external tyranny in any form than walk the road of selfhood now I don't know I say we're exploring it together is man so afraid of the burden the weight of being a self is he so apprehensive about walking the Siddhartha road or he tries it and finds out oh Jesus that's a bit tough that he then makes this sort of inner contract with himself to follow the gurus and to follow the leaders and the masters so that these tyrants both political and religious exist because you won't find carrion crows and vultures in a Japanese tea garden if you're finding maggots the meat is rotten if you're finding rats it's a sewer like I said the ego is the ghost that rose out of the self the grave of the self so once you start looking into this deeper relationship of what we are doing our neglect our avoidance of selfhood could that be in some way causing the state of decay that we see because don't blame the vultures and the, and the carrying crows they're doing exactly what they need to do the maggots are doing exactly what they need to do if something's dead then don't blame the maggots so if the psyche is in a state of decay don't blame the predators for coming by and setting up shop Jung said it, one of the greatest psychologists who ever lived, he said people will do anything no matter how absurd to stop from facing their souls. No matter how absurd. And in uh, one of my talks that I did in Los Angeles in 2012, I kind of rephrased this a little bit. I said, I said that people will do anything no matter how absurd to stop from doing their shadow work. It's basically the same thing, but it's a little bit, a little bit different slant on it, shadow work looking at themselves, all parts of themselves, not just trying to live in a one seasoned world. The great uh, German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said it this way, men would sooner die than think. And he's a philosopher so even his definition of what it means to think is not what we would think it is. There's a great weight in that word, a great meaning. You are the only creatures who can do it. You can think about meaning dogs animals have a higher a very high form of consciousness but they're not sitting there the swan on the lake is not saying oh shit I'm gonna die one day life, life's a bitch right it's not in any form of trepidation it's not in any form of yesterday or tomorrow it's absolutely in the now it's absolutely there and because it is completely present nature is present in its consciousness they're one we have this sort of bittersweet ability to question who we are right we're stuck with it Maybe we're running away from it, as I said, but even if you, we don't go there for a minute, we have this ability to think, to reason. It's something very precious and, and very fragile, and we can abuse it, or we can turn it off like most of the world has done. But he says that men would sooner die than think. It is very curious that the universality of an opinion should have so much weight with people, as their own experience might tell them that it is acceptance is entirely thoughtless and merely imitative process but it tells them nothing of the kind because they possess no self-knowledge whatsoever and he's speaking about the collectivism again and, and uh, we're gonna get into that in the second half of today's presentation I look at deeper at that concept then I found out that look 
One really can't even deal with psychic dictatorship after, after all the word has, the word psyche means the mind, without really dealing with consciousness. You see how the road, you start with one thing and it leads you into another place? And I love that, that organic, natural, unbigoted, unprejudiced, unpartisan, unbiased flow is what is, is the magic. More important than even the goal at the end, by the way. You start off trying to bring, bring down Big Brother. Well, my father was a communist. He worked all his life to bring down you know, whoever, the royals or whatever. You know. Did it work? Did he look at one moment? Did he look at his own self? No, he didn't. So the goal is less important than the process, the journey on which we go. That's where the magic is. But as I said, if you're going to talk about psychic dictatorship, you end up studying consciousness, the victim of dictatorship. And of course, philosophers all over the world, in every age, from Confucius in the East to the ones in the West, have always tried to understand this incredible thing we call consciousness. And they've tried to penetrate the mysteries of the mind. However, having said that, there are certain philosophers like Martin Heidegger who would never even use the word consciousness. He was very, very selective about the words that he used, and I don't think in, ever in his work he ever even used the word consciousness. Although he did use the word thinking, obviously he had to. Because in his mind, people are not conscious. They're not fully conscious yet. And this sort of echoed Hegel. I mean, not that these two philosophers were in any way the same, but it echoes what Hegel was also saying, and what later Sigmund Freud came to also talk about. Is that, you know something? If our social persona, the face we show to the world, is created socially by the approval of everybody else, then it's not an expression of selfhood, it is in fact a social construct. So to talk about one's consciousness is ultimately meaningless. A social persona, right, is not the same thing as consciousness. That's just a bunch of cues and affectations we learn like monkeys in order to get along you know, in the world with one another. Therefore, it's a social thing. It's that collectivist idea again. And that's why Heidegger was so particular about it. And for those who are actually interested in that particular concept or theory, they can go to my article on michaeltesarin.com called The Disciples of the Mysterium, and we did a really good interview on it uh, on Red Ice as well, for more who want to look into that concept. But Carl Jung spoke of this also. He said that the larger a society or confederacy, the greater the amalgamation of collective factors, which is typical of every large organization the more aggravated the moral and spiritual degeneration of the individual. So it's an old problem that both philosophers and psychologists have had to deal with. The great uh, teacher, Alan Watts, said that we seldom realize that in our most private thoughts and emotions are not actually our own. For we think in terms of languages and images which we did not invent, but which were given to us by our society. We copy emotional reactions from our parents. Society is our extended mind and body. Now, of course, he's referring to that person who hasn't differentiated yet. And I hope that everyone here understands that that's what you're here for in this world, is to separate yourself from the collective, not immerse yourself in it like the globalists want you to do. As I said, Heidegger, one thing he said that was really fa beautiful, is, is he said that, look, in German, the word thought, forethought, denken, is very similar to the word for thank you, or gratitude, denken which you have in this country, tak. They're all from the same root. In Norwegian you have tanka, right? He's trying to say, are your thoughts acts of gratitude? Wow. Are they? Are we even aware of the miracle? No, we're running into the one season world. We we're looking for the authority to tell us what to believe and what to think. We don't realize the magic is all happening in our heads already. And what of the life of a man whose, whose daily life, whose every thought, every waking moment is actually an act of thanks and gratitude for life itself? Not for some, what somebody else gives you, not for what other people say, do and think, but for the simple fact of being alive and never straying from that, never moving from that. Look what we inherit when we're not there. So you may not want the magic, that's fine, that's your choice. But look what you inherit when you don't. Look at the price that you make humanity pay. 